Right on. I'm all done. Um, we can get right into the word. Let me pray, and we're going to get right to work in uh, Acts chapter 27. Lord, I want to thank you for your faithfulness, and um, Lord, for how uh, you reveal yourself to us in the scriptures, and how they are, in fact, um, those uh, that compass for our lives. The, the word of God is is living, and it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it is intended to water the, the soil of our hearts and cause us to produce uh, supernatural fruit that, that is foreign to our sinful flesh. But uh, Lord, it's what we long for. So reveal yourself to us today in your word and, and by your spirit as well as you lead us into all truth. Uh, empower us to put feet on our faith and live out the truth. And we pray it together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. All right. Well, today, after 22 months, we are coming to the final two chapters of Acts. We're going to finish it next week. Um, Today, we're going to do all of chapter 27 and the first 10 verses of chapter 28. Um, And uh, it flows together in one story, and uh, and so we're going to unpack it that way. As you've seen, if you've been with us, Acts tells the story of the ongoing work of Jesus Christ uh, in and through everyday men and women like you and me. And uh, Acts 1.1 indicates that the book is, in fact, the continuation of the work that Jesus began uh, in his ministry here uh, in the embodiment of flesh on earth. Um, And then Acts 1.8 explains how this work of Jesus now continues Uh, through people working in the power of the Holy Spirit. And last week, we left off with Jesus working through the Apostle Paul as he testified um, before uh, Agrippa, who was uh, the the king, uh, and uh, Festus, who was the governor, and uh, and all. And so this was uh, Paul really sharing his testimony, talking about uh, his pathway from a life of persecution where where he was a religious zealot and uh, and really being the God squad in everybody's life and persecuting uh, the church. Um, and so he gave that testimony and how it transitioned to a life of promise as he was uh, born again by the Spirit of God and became a Christ follower. Uh, and then that gave way to a life of purpose. And Paul talked about his, his calling from God and how he was living out uh, his faith. And, <clears throat> and just as Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled that his disciples would be witnesses uh, of him in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and, and indeed to the ends of the earth, uh, so also last week we saw his prophecy concerning Paul in particular was being fulfilled, that he would bear his witness of Jesus uh, before kings and rulers. And that's what, in fact, he was doing. Um, but the story isn't finished. And today, uh, the, what the Acts narrative that we've been reading now, it nears its end. Um, and, and really, I mean, I handle that uh, delicately, talking about the book of Acts coming to an end, because there is an Acts chapter 29. Uh, and uh, it's not written in your Bible, it's written in your hearts, that you are Acts 29, and I am Acts 29, where, where, where this is a never-ending story until Christ returns, where we're living out um, our faith. But having said that, in regards to the particular story in Acts chapter 1 uh, through Acts chapter 28, today, the, the, uh, as it nears its end, what we see is Paul and his companions are beginning their, their trip to Rome. And, uh, and this is departure day. But as we're going to see, this journey is going to be one of the most perilous, out of control, and that's the key word, out of control. Uh, it's one of the most perilous, out of control journeys of Paul's life. And it's going to culminate in a violent shipwreck. And we're going to read about that. I don't know if you've ever experienced shipwreck. Uh, it, 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 is, it is profoundly traumatic. When I was a kid, um, I mean, this is, this is fully 50 years ago, I'm thinking back. I was with my dad. We were in his Jeep, and we were up in Palos Verdes near our house. We were, we were four-wheeling up there. 
And, uh, and you read about PV in the news right now, half of it's fallen down into the ocean, Portuguese bend and all, but we were, we were up there and there was a, we came around this, this bend and there were all these emergency vehicles uh, that were at the cliff and uh, in a real remote part. And, and so, of course, we drove over there. And I'll never forget it. Uh, the, there had been a shipwreck of, of a private boat uh, that had occurred, you know, there, there at, the, at the bottom of the, the rocks there at the bottom of the cliff. And, uh, and even now, 50 years later, two really vivid things stand out for me as, as I think about that memory. The first one was just the sheer violence of the event. That, that the, the boat that this family had been on was literally torn to pieces. I mean, there were chunks of it, uh, pieces of it now, uh, all spread about. I mean, it almost looked like the thing had blown up. And it was just the violence of the wind and the waves and being battered against the rocks and all. And the second thing that stands out to me is the, the utter helplessness of the victims. I mean, right as we pulled up there, it was a... It was a young girl, and, and you know she's probably in her early teens, and, and they have a blanket around her, and, and she, she can't even barely walk. I mean, everybody's supporting her, and, and she is, she's totally distraught, and, and um, I mean, this, this, this was a, a violent uh, event that led her just completely and utterly helpless in an out-of-control environment. And, and metaphorically speaking, maybe you haven't been through a shipwreck. Maybe you've never experienced somebody who's, who's in a shipwreck. But metaphorically speaking, shipwrecks come in all sorts of shapes, all sorts of conditions. Uh, you know, you lose a job or, or you lose your home or you discover that your spouse has been unfaithful to you or that, you know, you or a loved one has gotten some sort of a a life-altering medical diagnosis, or, or you're facing death, or, or whatever it is, and now the boat of your life is coming apart as you're tossed on the, 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 the rocks and, and, and just being blown apart. And whatever it is, the storms and the shipwrecks of life are traumatic because they shatter our illusion of control and they remind us that life is uncertain. And in fact, life is uncertain. According to the National Institute of Health, humans react poorly when their sense of control is either threatened or lost. Clinically, the loss of control, it's associated with stress, anxiety, burnout, depression, eating disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, Suicidal thoughts, substance abuse, anger, or debilitating fear in situations where you feel vulnerable, all of these things associated with experiencing a loss of control. And there's an interesting correlation between some who have been traumatized in their life by experiencing a lack of control that now over time what happens is they later become control freaks um, as a coping mechanism for situations in which they feel out of control. Now maybe it's not that extreme in your life, but you know, come to Jesus time, my hands up first because I'm because I, I am in this category. How many of y'all are control freaks? Can I see a show of hands? Yeah. Hello. Um, so the question then becomes, what do we do when the shipwrecks of life strip away our control? Or maybe it's not even a shipwreck. What do we do in situations where we are not in control? Because here's the deal. No matter what you're going through, there, there's... Just like there's two types of motorcycle riders, right? Those that have been down, those that are going down. Sorry for all of you who ride bikes. Uh, those are the two types of motorcycle riders. Well, there's two types of, of people in this world as it pertains to shipwrecks. Those that have experienced shipwreck and those that are going to experience shipwreck, right? So what do we do when we're out of control? That's the question we're answering today. 
Uh, Acts chapter 7, or 27, verse 1. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read it through the chapter, uh, get some running commentary along the way, then we're going to circle back, and we're going to zero in to, uh, to some specific things, all right? All right, Acts chapter 27, verse 1. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, notice the we, it's a first-person plural pronoun, and uh, remember who's writing the book of Acts, it's Dr. Luke. And so this indicates that now Dr. Luke uh, has, has joined the Apostle Paul along with uh, someone else who we'll read about in just a second. Um, and so we, it was decided that we should sail to Italy. Uh, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners uh, to one named Julius, who was a centurion of the Augustan regiment. This was a special regiment serving uh, the emperor, uh, kind of like our SEAL Team 6, how they're, they're a uh, tier one asset just to the president and uh, basically take their orders from the office of the president. Uh, this is kind of the same thing. This regiment reported to Caesar. They worked for Caesar exclusively and specifically. And so Paul's delivered to him. Why? Because he's appealed his case to Caesar, and so now he's going to Caesar. So Julius gets him. Verse 2, so entering a ship of Adramatium, and that's pronounced differently in the Greek, but that's the closest I'm going to get to it. So delivering a ship of, Adra uh, of Adramatium, we, we put to sea, uh, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, uh, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. He was part of the we, that, that plural uh, uh, pronoun that, that we read earlier. And you guys will remember um, Aristarchus when Paul had come to Jerusalem. He was part of that group that was traveling with him. Uh, they were sending to the Jerusalem church, you know, some money, some help. Uh, and so Aristarchus is this guy that's uh, part of uh, the Thessalonica church, and he's with Paul uh, and, uh, and coming in. And so uh, the next day, we landed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly, and he gave him liberty. Now, this is a big deal, because Paul's a prisoner, and Julius is a Roman centurion. And if a Roman centurion loses his prisoner, he then loses his life. So he's placing an immense amount of trust in the apostle Paul here, and I don't think it's a leap to, to just point out, clearly Paul has earned a measure of trust and respect from uh, this man. Your character matters. Your character counts. And so, uh, so he, he gives him this liberty to go uh, to his friends and receive care. Uh, and when uh, we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And, uh, and, you know, when, when you sail under the shelter of an island, if you're a fan of, you know, greatest catch or whatever, you see that, that the item or the island provides, um, you know, a weather shadow, if you will. Uh, and I used to take my little 18-foot boat over to Catalina all the time, and sometimes it was a little rough going across. And when you, when you got within, you know, a mile of the island, you'd, you'd fall in the weather shadow and things would calm down. And so this is what he's talking about here. Uh, and when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia uh, and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lucia, or Lycia, rather, um, which, by the way, this was the chief port uh, for the imperial grain fleet. Uh, that'll factor into the next verse, because there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship, no doubt a grain ship, uh, sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. And when we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off uh, Snida, Snidus, uh, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Sal Salmon. And passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lassia. And so Fair Havens was a semi-protected port it wasn't ideal, but at least it was semi-protected. And um, in verse 9 says, When much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the feast was already over, and so this would put it somewhere in early October, 
Uh, and what Luke is communicating here is by the time they fought all the weather and finally got to Fair Havens and, and then evidently spent some time in port there, uh, the, it, it, it's like, wow, sa sailing, is, we've entered a weather window where sailing is dangerous. That's what he's saying. Uh, and Paul advised them, saying, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. In other words, what Paul is saying here is, hey, I think sailing's a bad idea. We ought to just winter down here at Fair Havens. That's what he's trying to suggest. Um, and and it, it's like, well, how would Paul know? Well, Paul knows a lot of things, uh, you know, as the Lord reveals supernaturally things to him. But, but don't forget, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, tells us there, Paul's been shipwrecked three times before. So, so I'm envisioning Paul here in Fair Havens. He's like, this seems familiar to me. Like, I don't, I don't think this is such a great idea. I've seen this show before. Done in very well, right? And uh, so he gives his recommendation. He says, uh, hey, look, this ain't a good idea. Nevertheless, verse 11, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken of by Paul. And you can see that. He's like, you're a rabbi, and these guys, these are the pros. Like, you know, this guy owns the ship. If anybody's got a vested interest in, is it going to be safe? The owner certainly would be, and the captain knows what he's doing. God bless you. And because the harbor was not suitable to, to, to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from, from Fair Havens also, uh, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor in Crete, opening toward the southwest and the northwest and winter there. In other words, the openings to the harbor weren't as exposed to the weather. That's the idea. Um, verse 13. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, hey, the winds are favorable right now, let's do this. Uh, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete, but... Long at, not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Euryclidon. Uh, this is just a local weather phenomenon. When I was a firefighter here in this area, um, you know, when the, when the fire comes, you know, in the the uh, Cleveland National Forest and starts burning, we have a local weather effect. It's, it, it's we would call it the sundowner winds. Now they know it is the, the Elsinore effect, and so we knew. A, the, the winds would be blowing up slow during the daytime, but, it, but right after sunset, they'd start coming, the winds would change 180 degrees, it would barrel down like a freight train. And then this, this is the same thing, this Euryclidon, it was a, a northeastern that would blow, uh, that it was, you know, a difficult storm. Verse 15, and so when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. Like it's, a, the, it, it's like a little kid taking a big dog for a walk. It's like you're going where the dog wants to take you, and that's them, right? And running under the shelter of an island called Claudia, we secured the skiff with difficulty. They're dragging this ship behind them, and they, they want to keep it. And when they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. This is called frapping the ship, where you actually run cables off the bow and then you take it to the stern and all along and you tie this up and it literally holds the ship together. They don't want the boards to break apart. And fearing lest they should run aground on uh, the uh, Sirtis Sands, this is an infamous shipwrecking place off the coast of North Africa, um, they struck sail and were so driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day, they lightened the ship. And then, so this is, lightening the ship is where you, you throw off all the non-essential items. You know, the George Foreman grill goes, and the, the thigh masters go into the ocean, and the Ginsu knives, and things like that, right? Just, let's get rid of these non-essential things. And then on the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard. Okay, now it's getting serious. Like, they're throwing away, like, sails and, and ship's tackle. That's essential stuff. And now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, get the weight of this. 
All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. We're going to die out here. But after long abstinence, and by the way, let me just, again, I'll remind you, shipwrecks, metaphorically speaking, aren't all, you know, literally shipwrecks. And you might be here even today, and you're thinking, boy, can I relate. All hope is, is lost. I'm hanging on by a thread right now. But now when, at long, not long after Paul, uh, I'm sorry, uh, after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and he said, men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. Now we're going to look into this. We'll see that this isn't, uh, this isn't I told you so kind of attitude on, on Paul's uh, mind and heart here. Uh, he's, he's basically saying, hey, you didn't listen to me then, listen to me now, right? Uh, and he says, now I urge you, verse 22, to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. And he says, uh, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, uh, for I believe God, that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. And now when the 14th night had come, as we were driven up and down the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. And they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. A fathom is six feet, so that's about 120 feet. And uh, when they had gone a little farther, they took soundings again. They found it to be uh, about 90 feet, uh, 15 fathoms. And then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and they prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, in other words, the, you know, y'all are on your own. We're out of here is kind of what the sailors are doing, but they're, they're trying to be sneaky about it. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men, these sailors, stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. And, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of debate about, you know, what that means. Like, you know, this was very significant spiritually because God had said he was going to say it. it's a package deal. They all got to be a part of that. Or it could just simply be uh, they're professional sailors. Things are about to get really, really dicey right now. We're going to need their expertise to get everybody off safely. That's kind of the idea. And then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and they let it fall off. In other words, there goes the light boat, lifeboat, let it go. And as the day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, today is the 14th day you've waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. Hey, you know what? Y'all are going to need your strength here in a minute because you'll be swimming for your lives. And uh, so, you know, you haven't eaten in two weeks. You might want to do that. And when he had said these things, he took bread, he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he'd broken it, he began to eat. And then they were all encouraged, and they also took food themselves. And in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. And so when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, and they threw the wheat into the sea. So now they've thrown off, you know, all their non-essential stuff, all their essential gear, and now their very cargo, uh, which was, you know, the most precious thing to the people that own the ship. This is, this is how we make our money. Now that goes into the sea as well. And when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible, and they let go the anchors and left them in the sea. And meanwhile, loosening the rudder ropes, they hoisted the mainsail to the wind, and they made for shore. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the prow struck fast, 
and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. And the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. Every man for himself. Do, do the best you can. And the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. Uh, you know, you get one gal's on a door and her buddy can't get on the door. And so he's just, you, yeah, you get the thing. And, uh, and so it was that they all escaped safely uh, to land. All right. Uh, we're going to pause right there. Um, that's a mouthful, right? If you're paying attention, here's what you caught. Um, you caught this thread of control that's woven uh, throughout the story, right? Uh, a thread of control, or should I say a, a lack thereof, right? Uh, this out of control, this out of controlness, this word I just made up, uh, is going on. Verse one, it was decided that they should sail, that we should sail to Italy. You know, the, the, the idea there is, is to determine, to resolve, or to decree, but this wasn't Paul's decision, right? The way that this sentence is structured in the passive voice places the focus on the verb rather than the noun, and, you know, the focus is <coughs> on the decision to sail rather than on who made the decision, right? Now, ostensibly, we can determine that the decision to sail in the beginning um, was the determination of Governor Festus and not the determination of, of Paul, but we know that it was even bigger than that, right? Matthew Henry, in his commentary, he points out that it was determined by the counsel of God before it was determined by the counsel of Festus that Paul should go to Rome for who, whatever man intended God had work for Paul to do there. So ultimately, this was God's determination. But again, notice who wasn't part of this determination? The Apostle Paul. Now, this very much concerned him, but he had no choice in the matter. You know, sure, God had tipped him off ahead of time that he was sending him to Rome. And, and certainly, Paul had exercised a certain amount of control when he submitted to, Paul, to the Lord's will to go to Jerusalem in the first place, and when he exercised his rights as a Roman citizen to appeal to Caesar, he had a certain amount of control in those instances, right? But in regards to the unfolding events that we're reading about, Paul had very little control. He had very little say in what was going on. And another thread of control, or seemingly lack thereof, that runs through this story is, in, again in verse 1, Paul was delivered to the Roman centurion as a prisoner in chains, right? And as well in verse 6, it was the centurion who selected the ship that they were going to sail on. Paul didn't get a say in that. Um, and again in verses 9 through 12, uh, as even though he tried, Paul didn't get a say in whether they stayed in Fairhaven or not. Uh, that was the centurion's decision. He rejected uh, what Paul had, had, had suggested. Now, imagine how frustrating this would be to the Apostle Paul if you were the Apostle Paul. How frustrating would this situation be? Especially when you're in Fairhaven and you're like, hey, I've seen this movie before. It ends bad. We shouldn't sail. And they're like, eh. We're not going to listen to you. And, and I've been through this three times before. So the, the, the point is, and, and, and here's for us, the, there, there's several points of application when we're talking about being out of control. And Paul is very much out of control in terms of being able to dictate all of these things that I've just mentioned. And, and so we can learn from this. Here's point number one, if you're taking notes. Uh, one of the ways that we can handle being out of control Paul was obediently subservient, number one, uh, to the authority under which he was placed. That's important. He was, he was obedient and subservient under the authority in which he 
uh, was placed, right? Um, we do parenting classes here uh, from time to time. And one of the things that, that we have pointed out in, in the past, we will point out in the future, is that um, when, when you want your kids to obey, uh, there's, there's, this, there's this subtle dynamic, and all you parents will recognize it, where, where the kid will, you know, reluctantly get to the point where they will obey outwardly, but inwardly, they, their heart is not with you, right? They're, they're, they're like, I'm, you know, you, you're like, hey, you know, stand up or, or whatever the, the command is. And, and, and they're like, you know, uh, uh, or, or you're, you're telling the kid, hey, you know, stop, you know, sit down, sit down, listen to me kind of thing. And they sit down, but with their attitude and everything says, I'm sitting down on, on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside, right? And you all know what that is and what that looks like, right? And, and so, you know, here's, here's Paul. Clearly, he has earned the respect of this guard, right, when he lets him go and receive care. So, so there's, 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 this, uh, there's this respect that has been, that, that, that Paul has earned. Why? Because he's not characterized as, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. And, uh, and the, the issue for us is how, and, and you really need to take a walk with this, what I'm about to say, how you handle submitting to authority when you don't have control over the decision says everything. So how do you? How do you handle submitting to authority when you don't have control over the decision? Right? Do you grumble? Do you complain? Do you argue? Do you trash your boss behind his back or whoever else it happens to be? See, Paul said this to the Philippians in Philippians 2, 14, 15. He said, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Let me ask you another question. Do you insincerely obey on the outside and harbor disdain on the inside? Again, Paul speaking to the Ephesians, he said, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God. Here's the key from the heart right? With goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or whether he is free. So how we live and behave when we are under authority, it matters and it is very important. Here's the second way that Paul handled being out of control. Paul expressed his concerns to those who are in authority. Notice again, verses 9 through 11, right? They, they, uh, the, the, they're in Fairhaven, and uh, Paul, you know, he's like, hey, this is not a good idea. And, and so I'm going to, very respectfully, he's basically saying, I've seen this movie before, ends really badly, you should not do it, right? And... <clears throat> It's interesting, the different translations of this. In the NIV, it says Paul advised them. Uh, in, uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the New King James here, it says Paul advised them. In the NIV, it says he warned them. In the New Living Translation, it says he spoke to them. In the NASB, it says Paul started admonishing them, which kind of sounds like reading them the riot act, but... But really, it's just telling them in no uncertain terms it's a bad idea, right? Um, and the idea is simply to recommend or advise a different course. Um, and again, it's important that we remember Paul knows what he's talking about. After three shipwrecks, he should be able to say and be heard about this matter. But he's not. So he's, he's under authority, but he also has very critical information that is germane to the situation. And so what does he do? What you see here with Paul is he's practicing what's known 
uh, in, in management circles as managing up. Paul is practicing managing up. It looks like this. You simultaneously respect the authority that you're under, but you also attempt, and here's the key, in good faith to help the leader lead. You want to make the leader successful. So what do you do? You practice you know, what's known as the military method of problem solving. You say to the person who's in authority over you, you say, hey, I think this is a problem. And, and then you should take it a step further. I see some possible solutions. You know, ideally, here's three possible solutions to this problem. Uh, and here's the one I recommend of those three. And here's why I recommend it, right? And, and you know, and, and, and here's what we're tempted to do. We're tempted in a situation when, we're, when we have to submit to somebody who has authority in a situation, we disagree with them. We're like, oh, it's your funeral, you know? And, and good luck to you, you know? And we just, we're like, we're gonna let them fail spectacularly. We're not gonna give them any input whatsoever. That's not loving at all. See, the Bible says we have to respect and submit to authority because God establishes it. Romans 13, one and two, everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. And we're like, but they're wrong. Okay, give your input, give it sincerely, do everything you can to help them succeed and then let go because you haven't been given the authority in that situation. They have, right? And so there is that way that we can respect authority and we can submit to authority at the same time. And notice what you don't see here. When, when Paul's advice isn't heeded, Luke doesn't say Paul copped an attitude. Paul threw a temper tantrum, right? Uh, and you might say, well, isn't verse 21 when he says, hey, I, you know, I told you, you should listen to me. You know, isn't that I told you so? No, he's simply reapplying the, management, the managing up principle when he says, hey, look, you didn't listen to me before, I think you should listen to me now. And again, uh, he's, he's just respectfully giving input. Now, the third way that Paul handled being out of control, here it is, Paul listened to God, Paul trusted in God, and he boldly exhorted others to do the same thing. Notice there in verses 22 through 25. He says, I urge you to take heart. There's not going to be any loss of life among you, only of this ship, for God stood by me, or, you know, an angel uh, of God uh, to whom I belong, whom I serve. He said, don't be afraid. You must uh, be brought before Caesar. That's important. And indeed, God has granted you all, those who sail with you. And, and remember, Jesus had appeared to Paul uh, when... Um, he was in prison back in Acts chapter 23, right? The, the verse is this, the following night, the Lord stood by Paul and he said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness in Rome. The Lord himself had told Paul that. Now, two quick applications on this point. Uh, number one, you know, the importance of prayer and listening to God especially in the storms we face, we need to, we need to take a walk with that. And I'm, I'm reminded of a story that we read in Mark chapter four. Uh, the story is this, on the same evening when, uh, when, on the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. They're on the Sea of Galilee. That's really important. And now when they had left the multitude, they took him in the boat as he was, and the other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern. He's taking a nap on a pillow. And they woke him up, and they said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? These are seasoned fishermen. They're used to the conditions. So you know the storm is bad when they think they're going to die. Sound familiar? Right? And then Jesus arose, he rebuked the wind and uh, said to the sea, peace be still. 
And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that the wind and the sea obey him? Why does Jesus rebuke him? Because the whole story starts off with him telling them, we're going to the other side. Right? Jesus had said, this is how it's going to go down. And in the same way, Jesus has said that to Paul. He told him, you're going to Rome. You're going to appear before Caesar. So here's what Paul knows. This shipwreck's bad. Everybody thinks they're going to die. And, uh, and I know that. But Jesus said, I'm going to the other side. Right? In your life and in mine, it's the same way. It's the same way. As Jesus speaks to us in his word and his prayer, our job is to trust and obey. I'm reminded of that, that you know, hymn that, that we sing, you know, that traditional hymn, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And, and the second thing I just want to say about listening to God, obeying him and his commandments, is the importance of of remembering God's faithfulness in the past storms that we've been through. It is so critically important. See, Paul has been watching God fulfill prophecy after prophecy, and God said that he was sending Paul to the Gentiles, and what did he do? He sent him to the Gentiles. And God said that Paul would appear before kings and before rulers, and what happened? He appeared before kings and rulers. And God said that he's sending Paul to Rome. And so what's going to happen? He's going to Rome. He's not going to die in this shipwreck. And we see this in scripture. David, you know, the, in, in early on, King David, he's, he goes to fight Goliath. And you're like, wow, this is the greatest. This is the first real trial in David's life. And then you read on and you realize, well, no, it's not. Because he had another trial when, you know, Samuel had shown up and anointed him to be king. And then all of a sudden, his, his dad doesn't think that much of him. And now he's tending sheep, really lowliest job you could have. And he's the runt of the litter. And his dad thinks he's the least of all of his brothers, even then. And he's like, did you abandon me, God? What's happening? And now, you know, insult to injury. The bear attacks him out there. A lion attacks him out there. But all of these things... They informed, look, God is faithful. God's faithful. And this is what David says in his testimony. Goliath shows up, and David happens to be on the scene, and, and everybody's afraid of him, and he's like, let me at him. And Saul's like, you can't kill him. And he's like, look, I've been tending a sheep for my, fa my father uh, since I was a boy, and when the lion or the bear showed up, I, I, God gave me the power to overcome them. This, this Philistine is going to be just like them. And so the thing is, is that we need to, to, to make a habit of listening to God and remembering the things that he does in our lives. The psalmist said this, Psalm 107, give thanks to the Lord for he's good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out, tell others he's redeemed you from your enemies. For he's gathered the exiles from many lands, from the east, the west, the north, and the south. And then he goes on to say this. Some, uh, some went off to the sea in ships, plying the trade routes of the world. Now, he's just talked about before this, those that were lost in the wilderness, those that were lost in darkness, those that were lost in sin, those who were imperiled by circumstances. And so now he's saying, hey, some people had this circumstance. They went off to the sea in ships. Uh, and, uh, and they too observed the Lord's power in action, his impressive works on the deepest seas. He spoke and the winds rose, stirring up the waves. Their ships were tossed to the heavens and they plunged again to the depths. The sailors cringed in terror. They reeled and they staggered like drunkards and they were at their wits end. Lord help, they cried in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to, to a whisper and he stilled the waves. Uh, what a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbor. Here it is. Here's the key. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things that he has done for them. Let them exalt him publicly and before the congregation and before the leaders of the nation. 
Listen, let them make a habit of remembering and proclaiming the Lord's faithfulness. Let you make that your habit. And so these are the things that are going on here, and now they're shipwrecked in Malta. Uh, And we see another very important lesson in regards to control, that in every circumstance, listen, God is working. In every circumstance, God's working, right? And this fourth way that Paul handled being out of control is that, listen, Paul served Jesus wherever he was in the moment. He served Jesus wherever he was in the moment. Now, we're going to wrap this up, but, but let's, let's look at these first 10 verses in, in Acts 28 as we do. It says, now, uh, when they had escaped... Uh, they then found out that the island was called Malta. So they shipwreck into into Malta. Everybody's saved from the ship. They're now all on shore. And the natives showed us unusual kindness for they kindled a fire and they made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came and... Uh, because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. You're like, what? Come on. I just went through this shipwreck and now I got a viper on my hand, right? And so when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer uh, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. You know what? He's this guy. He can't escape what he's done. By the way, Paul was a murderer. He had the blood of the saints on his hands, right? And they're like, well, this is, this is him getting his just rewards. But Paul shook off the creature into the fire and he suffered no harm. You know, he's a bad dude like Paul. He might have looked like Danny DeVito, but, but, but you can't say that this guy, well, he's just the boss, man. So he shakes this thing off into the fire Uh, And clearly it's the Lord just sparing him, saving him. Uh, Verse six, however, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked at him for a long time, they're watching this guy like a hawk and they saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds and they said that he was a God. This guy, wow, you know. Uh, in that region, there was, an, uh, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was uh, uh, Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of, of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery, and Paul went into him. He's kicked in to pastoral mode here and senses the leading of the Holy Spirit. He lays hands on him, he prays for him, and he heals him. And again, this is God You know, God's been working through Paul and the apostles in miraculous ways and authenticating the gospel message that they're going to preach. And uh, and so this was, when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases, hey, there's a miraculous doctor in town. They also come and they were also healed. Verse 10, and they also honored us in many ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. Okay, we're going to look at next week uh, when they departed and how the end of the story goes. But listen, the, the, folk, the, the, the focus here, <clears throat> let me get back on track with my notes, is that Paul served Jesus where he was, wherever he was in the moment. Wherever he was in the moment, that's where Paul served. He didn't live a compartmentalized faith where he clocked in and he clocked out. Right? or where he served only under tightly controlled, ideal circumstances. He didn't say, hey, I just went through a shipwreck and I just you know, had this viper bite me and so I'm off duty, you know? don't bug me. No, he, he understood his calling. He understood that his calling wasn't geographic or that it wasn't chronographic or there wasn't limited you know, the idea to a specific time or a specific place or specific circumstance of his choosing. Rather, he understood that God was in control of everything, the time, the place, the circumstance. And guess what? 
wow, I just went through this great deal. God wants me on Malta. He's got a job for me here. God's got a job for you right here, even in the midst of your circumstances. It's not like, hang on, God, let me just get through these circumstances and I'll go to serve you again. No, God's saying, I want to work in the midst of your circumstances. When I was a kid, my dad, he was in the off-road industry in the 70s, which was a pretty cool time to be in the off-road industry. Everything was coming out then. And he was involved in a lot of cool things. I was meeting some really awesome people. And, you know, Parnelli Jones was getting involved in some off-road racing in the Baja and stuff like that. And it was cool. But my dad had this, this product that was in his office. He had all these products. And he had, you know, gallons and gallons of this product called Armorall. It had just come out. It was brand new, just come out. And, uh, and there was this thing that said, you know, Armor All Distributor. And I, and I said to my dad, because I was always, I mean, you ask the people in my neighborhood, I'd go door to door selling cookies. I'd go to door, you know, trying to make a buck and, you know, always, you know, plying my wares in, in the neighborhood. And I'm, I'm thinking, I could sell this stuff, right? And I'm like, can I, can I sell this? Can I, be an, can I be an Armor All Distributor? And my dad says, Sure. And I'm thinking, well, what do you got to do? What has to happen? What, you know, how do I become an armor all distributor? And my dad said, I just made you one. You are one. Go take it. Go do what you're going to do. I couldn't get it through my mind. Being an armor all distributor, right? And, and the, the point is, you're a distributor. God has made you one. And so distributors distribute. And, and the attitude, the idea for us is that God's in control. He governs all the events of your life. And, you, and, and our job is just simply to say, Lord, here I am. And I don't understand when you tell me I'm going to Rome. And, uh, and then you didn't, you didn't tell me anything about a shipwreck. You didn't tell me anything about, you know, Malta and a viper biting me. And then all of a sudden, now I'm exhausted. I, I just, you know, 14 days, sleepless, throwing up and all of this stuff. And, and now what? I got to go heal people too? Yeah. Because you're a distributor and God's doing a work. Father, we come to you and we thank you for the book of Acts and we thank you for our time together in it.